As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, you abandoned my flock, left them to be attacked by every wild animal. And though you were my shepherds, you did, ser you did search for my sheep when they were lost. You took care of yourselves and left the sheep to starve. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I now consider these shepherds my enemies, and I will hold them responsible for what has happened to my flock. I will take away their rights to feed the flock, and I will stop them from feeding themselves. I will rescue my flocks from their mouth. The sheep will no longer be their prey. So be it. start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, we just thank you that your word became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus gave up heaven to come down to save us, but not just to save us, to give us peace and joy in this life. Lord, whether we do have a divided country or whether we have freedoms or we don't have freedoms, you have called us to be a faithful people. You have called us to be obedient You've called us to love one another, and you've called us even more to live an abundant life through Jesus Christ, showing others the way. Let us be kingdom-minded people, to live like your children, regardless of what the world is around us. May we not worry about the things of this wor wor world, but put our faith and trust and hope in you. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. Open up our eyes and ears to hear what your word does say to the churches, Lord, and help us to be your hands and feet until Jesus Christ returns. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. So last week I talked about having ears to hear. Merle, you missed that one, but I followed up with that. Ears to hear what Jesus is saying to the churches. And that goes all the way back to the beginning when Jesus says, or when God says, if you have ears, that equals you should obey, period, because I am the Lord your God. We talked about what Jesus said in the first three letters to the churches in Revelations about being overcomers, how to live in this world so that you will be sure to overcome this world and enter into the next world, how to live as a child of the kingdom of heaven, as a citizen of heaven, and we looked at the first three letters and read in Revelation 2, 7, To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. And from Revelation 2, 11, the one who overcomes will not be harmed by the second death. And from Revelation 2, 17, to the one who overcomes, I will give hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone inscribed with a new name, known only to the one who receives it. Those first three letters talk about the fact that we as still breathing and living Christians, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, disciples of Jesus, believers, followers of Christ, however you want to put that, that we have to overcome. We have already overcome because of the blood of the Lamb. We also have overcome because of our testimony, it says in Revelation. Because we have not denied the faith, we have stood firm and we have lived as Jesus taught us to live obedient, set-apart lives so that others see our good works, that it glorifies our Father in heaven, that it draws them to, to Him. What good is your life, what good is this church, if we're not reaching out and being the hands and feet of Jesus, if we're not living out the great command and the great commission? If you have ears to hear... Obey. Listen to how much Jesus is telling the churches that He loves them. Less than a 70 years or around 70 years of church history has undergone when these letters come to the churches. And it starts with that first letter saying, You don't love me as much as you used to. It's easy to fall into that. It's easy to become complacent. But it's not what Jesus intended. 
He intended for you to have life, abundant life, joy, abundant joy, peace, abundant peace in any and every circumstance in this life and then have eternal life. So I've got a question for you to think about. What is life as opposed to death? Is it just eternal? Or is it life here and now? Were the disciples, the people that knew Jesus, was the early church, were they comforted by Jesus coming to this earth, dying for their sins? The penalty, the wages of their sin was death, but now it's eternal life if they put their faith and trust in Jesus. But it didn't just stop there. They saw, they heard of a resurrected Jesus. Paul talks about the new body that we will receive and the life that we live now to, to run it like we're running a race. Because Jesus has given us the power over sin in our lives. He has given us a call to be His hands and feet, to go and continue, as Luke says, to continue the works that Jesus started until that day in Revelation when we see a new heaven and a new earth. We don't need to fear the things that are out there. We just need to keep focused and stand firm, which that means we need to put on God's armor because we're fighting a spiritual battle. That means we need to be united together. That means we need to study and pray. And of course that means, as Jesus said when He summed up the Old Testament law and the, and, the script, and the prophets, he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That encompasses the Ten Commandments. They start out with your loving God and giving Him the glory and honor that He deserves, and then on to the creation that He created in His image, mankind. We don't know love until we understand God's love. And if we don't love our brothers... How in the world do we understand God's love? So I ask the question again, what is life as opposed to death? So many of Jesus' teachings meant this life, and then you will receive eternal life. In the Revelation, uh, in the first letter to the church in Ephesus, he says, I know your deeds. You're doing a great job. But, that, that big word, but... I have this against you. You don't love me as much as you used to. I said it, and I'll probably continue to say it, but who wants a relationship like that? Where this, all this was great back here. We did all these things. It was so loving and so good. The rest of the world didn't matter. To now we've got a complacent relationship. We're just trying to hold on until it's over. <laughs> Is that how you look at your Christian faith as your walk? Just, just let me get by until I can get to glory. Or do you look at every breath that you have today as living as a child of the kingdom of heaven, letting your light shine so others see it, so that you can train up your children and grandchildren, you can be a light to the world. And that requires going and doing, being the hands and feet of Jesus. Jesus told the young rich ruler, when he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, go sell everything that you have. Now that came after the young rich ruler said, I've already kept all these commandments. But Jesus said, you have that one thing that you lack. You're still holding on to the things of this world instead of clinging to me. And you can't be my disciple unless you deny yourself first. And then take up your cross, whatever that means, and then follow after Jesus. So I ask you this question now. How much are you loved? You. You. Not someone else, not your neighbor, not your friend. How much are you loved? Jesus loved you enough, loves you enough that He gave up heaven. He came down to the creation, had human beings care and take care of Him. He faced death when He was an early child. He faced death all throughout His ministry. He didn't have a place to lay His head. He didn't worry about the things of this world. He came to do the Father's will. And He told us to do the same. This new life that we've been given. Psalms 85, I want to read that to you from the message. This was written a thousand years before Jesus Christ. God who smiled on, on your good earth, who brought good times back to Jacob, 
You lifted the cloud of guilt from your people and put their sins far out of sight. You took back your sin-provoked threats. You cooled your hot, righteous anger. Help us again, God of our help. Don't hold a grudge against us forever. You aren't going to keep this up, are you? Scowling and angry year after year. Why not help us make a fresh start, a resurrection life? Then your people will laugh and sing. Show us how much you love us, God. Give us the salvation we need. I can't wait to hear what he'll say. God's about to pronounce his people well, the holy people he loves so much, so they'll never again live like fools. See how close his salvation is to those who fear him. Our country is home base for his glory. Love and truth meet in the streets. Right living and whole living embrace and kiss. Truth spouts green from the ground. Right living pours down from the skies. Oh yes, God gives goodness and beauty. Our land responds with bounty and blessing. Right living strides out before him and clears a path for his passage. You think maybe this country wouldn't be so divided if we would live like we're supposed to live? You think that might be the first problem and maybe God needs to bring about some change in our lives? This, song is call, this psalm is calling for revival. The King James Version, where the message says it this way, Why not help us make a fresh start, a resurrection life? Then your people will laugh and sing. Show us how much you love us, God. Give us the salvation we need. I think all those things were answered in Jesus Christ. The King James Version says, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thou, thy salvation. So the question I ask now is, do you live? Do you live the life that Jesus called you to live? Do you live an abundant life that Jesus called you to live? The word used here is haya, like that. That's how I remember to pronounce it. Haya. It's used 260 times in the Old Testament. It's used 12 times for revival or revive. It's used 153 times simply as live. Because see, God created us, you, to be in a relationship with Him. And then He created others, starting with your spouse, so that you could live in relationship with them. Huh, just like Jesus says. The Lord your God loves you, puts you in a relationship with Him. You should love Him back with everything that you have. Then He gave you others so that you can live in a relationship with them and love them. That is what kingdom children live like. That's how we live before sin ever came into this world. That's how we will live again and even better when God purges this world of the sin that's in it. He renews everything. To revive means to live. If you look at the, di the dictionary definition, you'll get an improvement in the conditioning or strength of something. An instant of something becoming popular, active, or important again. It should have never got unimportant. You should have never got to the point where you're decaying and dying. Jesus died so that you would live. Not just live, but live abundantly until He returns for you. If you believe that, then are you living for Him? Ordinarily, the concept of revival assumes that a church that was once thriving has now fell into spiritual decline. So the word revival means that they need to be made alive again from the fallen state which they're in, which is cold, decaying, and dying. And this is how many Christians are and many churches are. When you've got the love of God living inside of you, He dwells in you. Is that love pouring out of you? Or are you distracted by things? Do you hold a grudge against your neighbor? What is keeping you from loving your neighbor and loving God? They need to be brought back into a right relationship where they can thrive. I've got a video with some words. And then he gave you others to be in a relationship with them so that you would know God and make Him known. 
Genesis 2, 7 says that God breathed life into us. He said, hi <laughs> You're alive. Live like it. I created you, designed you for a purpose. In my image and glory. And then Jesus said, hi I've died for you so that you'd realize that. So that you will live the way you were created in the first place. And you couldn't do it before. You couldn't do it through the law or anything else. And you've been unfaithful, but God is faithful. He has given you exactly what He promised, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Chosen One, who would lay down His life for His sheep. Live by the power of God. Live for Him. Bring glory to Him. Live loving God with everything you have and loving others knowing and making Him known, restoring this creation until the day that I restore it again permanently. Don't live your life for the things of this world. Don't have other uh, uh, gods before me. Live for God. Think about how far you've fallen and fall back in love with Jesus. So I passed out some verses. Kendall, you've got the first one. It's John 10.10. 10. What, what does it say? Mark, how about Luke 10.20? Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. <clears throat> Matthew 5.12, Cameron. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is rich in heaven. Matthew 11.28, Bonnie. And Matthew 7, 12, Rose. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Matthew 7, 12. I didn't pick those verses, but you can see the theme there in my whole uh, journey this year with the jar started with John 10, 10. And that's been the verses that Sherry's pulled out since then. And we've been meditating on them. This is what I want you to do. You know, I can challenge you to read the Word. I can challenge you this and that. But get that loving relationship with God and with others every single day. Those are the verses that we've put in and then our responses back to them. I couldn't have picked anything better if I'd have tried. It's not random. It's not anything else. And then we've studied and contemplated on that. And we're going to look at John 10.10 10 a little more today. Because there's an important part. That's the B part of the verse. So who was talking about the A and B before in Awana? Because somebody asked about Marianne. I couldn't remember. Who. What's the B part mean? Because so many times we put the emphasis on the B part. Today we're going to put the emphasis on the A part of that verse. Does anybody know what it is? What is it? That's the second part of the verse. Okay, we'll get to it in a minute. Because if you don't understand the first part of the verse, you won't understand how far you've fallen again. And Jesus is trying to give you life. So I'm going to go to the last four letters of Revelation now and go through them briefly and show you a sequence of what they're saying again. Maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't. I'm starting in Revelation 2 verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like a blazing fire and whose feet are like polished brass. Jesus sees everything. He knows every deed, every thought. And His children especially will be held accountable. Yes, you will receive eternal life, but you will also be held accountable for what you did with this life. Because Jesus died so that you could have abundant life here and now. His feet are strong. You can depend on Him. Verse 19, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and your latter deeds are greater than the first. Great job. Give yourselves a hand. But that's not all the letter, is it? The very next word, but... I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. You tolerate sin in the church, in your lives, in your homes. Who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching she misleads. Oh, children, follow this word of God. Follow it now. Don't do what I do, right? Because I pick and choose the ones I do. Hmm. Okay, we'll go on. 
My, she, by her teaching, she misleads my servants to be sexually immoral and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Even though I have given her time to repent of her immorality, she is unwilling. Behold, I will cast her on to a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. That's all you've got to do. Stop. <laughs> Turn to Jesus instead. Then I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am the one who search minds and hearts. And I will repay each according to their deeds. He's talking to the churches, not those who don't have ears to hear. Verse 24, But I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to her teaching and have not, lear have not learned the so-called deep things of Satan, I will place no further burden upon you. Nevertheless, hold fast to what you have until I come. And the one who overcomes and continues in my work until the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter and shatter them like pottery, just as I received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirits say to the churches. Now the first three letters Jesus told us that if we overcome, we will have a right to eat from the tree of life. We will not be harmed by the second death. We'll be able to feed off him eternally and we'll have a new name or he'll have a new name, whichever way you want to view it. Now he's saying, if you continue in this life, in your works, you will overcome and you will even reign. Not only will you have eternal life, but you'll be building those treasures in heaven where moth does not destroy and thieves do not come in and steal. Why would you ever want to focus the life that you have, however many days that is, on building up material things instead of working for eternal riches in heaven? The next letter, chapter 3, verse 1, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Jesus is the one who holds your life together, holds the church together, gives you the power to live this life, has saved you from the power of uh, the penalty of sin and the power of sin so that you can live. He has given special gifts through the Spirit to bind His body together to do incredible things, even greater things than He did while He walked on this earth. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive. You think you're alive. Others even think you're alive. But or yet you are dead. They're ta he's talking about life here on earth and spiritual life. You're acting like you're alive here on earth because you're doing things, but you're not in the right relationship with me, so the things you're doing are in vain. You're doing from the wrong reason. You're not doing them because you love the Lord your God with everything and you love your neighbor. You're marking off a list or you're trying to, to live by the law, whatever it is. You're trying under your own power and might. You're trying to have a love affair with someone else while you're having a love relationship with Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Wake up! Wake up! And strengthen what remains. Remember... Then what you have received and heard, keep it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know the hour when I will come upon you. A thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus came so that you could have life. We're going to get back to John in just a minute. So that you could have life now and eternal life. And we should be longingly expecting for Him. Think of the other things that Jesus said. Being a good steward of what He's given us. And the more that He gives us that we handle properly, the more that He will give us. Think of those things. He left so that you could be doing what He started doing. But you do have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their garments, and because they are worthy, they will walk with me in white. Like them, he who overcomes will be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Sixth letter. To the angel in the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of the one who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David who will reign, who has given you authority and commissioned you to bring people into the kingdom that He'll reign in. 
What he opens, no one can shut. He has opened up the kingdom, and he has stewarded you, commissioned you to be faithful with that information, those keys. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door which no one can shut. You have an open door for ministry if you'll just live as Jesus lives. Don't you want your children, your loved ones, to spend an eternity with you instead of an eternity apart from you? For you have a little strength, yet you have kept my word. You have not denied my name. Look at those who belong to the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews but are liars instead. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I love you because you have kept my commandments to persevere. I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never again leave it. Upon him I will write the name of my God and the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. Boy, there's a lot of promises here. If you'll just stay faithful and true, if you'll keep his words, if you'll not deny his name, that means you need to be witnessing in the first place. And if you'll persevere, hold fast so that no one takes the crown that you have. Last letter, the lukewarm church. I said it before, I'm going to say it again to, do, to put it in there. Who wants a lukewarm relationship? Jesus is clear, he does not. He will spit you out of his mouth. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these are the words of amen. That means, do you agree? Yes, amen. Verily, verily, I tell you, do you agree with this? Fall back to your first love. Be an overcomer. Love me with all of your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love them as I have loved you. Amen? Amen. Okay. The faithful and true witness... The originator of God's creation, it's all about Jesus. It was from the beginning, and it surely should be since he laid down his life to save you. Save you. I know your deeds. Doesn't say what they are here. Doesn't matter, because you're neither hot nor cold. Even if they had the best deeds there could have been, or if they had bad deeds, it didn't matter. What mattered is their love relation was just eh. And Jesus won't tolerate eh. How I wish you were one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. You say that I am rich. I have grown wealthy and need nothing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. What do we need to do? Jesus counsels, he begs, he entreats to you to buy from him gold refined by the fire. Yeah, you might have to deny yourself to do that. You might have to suffer a little. You might have to take up a cross, an instru instrument of suffering and death even, to follow Jesus to true riches instead of the things that you think that you're holding as idols because you're living more for them than the Creator who gave them to you in the first place. So that, buy these things from Jesus so that you may truly become rich. White garments so that you may be clothed and your shameful nakedness not exposed. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those I love I rebuke and discipline. Therefore be earnest with great zeal and enthusiasm. Urgency even. Buy from Jesus the things that you need. Behold, Jesus stands at the door and knocks and says, You shut me out. Will you please let me back in? I love you. Do you not understand that? The path that you're on, where I'm not your first love, you're really poor, pitiful, naked, and blind. And I'm going to keep knocking because I love you. I don't want you to waste your life. 
I want you to live a life abundantly in all circumstances. I want you to tell others about me and live a life that shows it. A life that loves God, has only one God, not other gods. That lives a life that you were intended when God said, Hiya! And breathe the breath of life into you. And the life that I gave up so that you would live. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice, and then they open the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. True fellowship, the way God intended and Jesus restored us back to. <clears throat> to the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now to summarize the first three letters again in my words, okay? If you have ears, you better listen up, right? And you better obey what Jesus says to the church. If you want to be an overcomer and have eternal life. If you want to eat from the tree of life. If you don't want to be harmed by the second death. If you want to continue to be nourished for all eternity and have a new name, a new identity in Christ, then be an overcomer. Fall back into your first love. To summarize the last four letters of the church, don't tolerate sin in your life. Instead, continue in the works that Jesus commissioned and empowered you to do. As His hands and feet. You might think you're alive, but wake up because you're dead. Remember what you've heard and received. Be like the few and choose the narrow path, the narrow door, the narrow gate. Don't be one who chooses the wide gate and lead others. Lead those into the narrow gate because you chose to live by these words. Not by your own power and your own might, but by Jesus' power. Denying yourself. By letting the Spirit transform you and change you from the inside out. Strengthen what you have. The things that you've heard. Fall back in love. I'm standing at the door still knocking. Do you love me as much as I love you? That's my summary. God breathed life into man so that they could be in a relationship, loving relationship and fellowship with Him and created others to do the same and for us to love them. There's your great, commission, great command. And you can't do the great commission, you can't go out and make disciples thereof when this isn't what it's all about. When you don't love the Lord with all your mind, heart, body, soul, and strength. Because you know what you'll be doing? You'll be leading them down the path of destruction. That's why Jesus said those words in John 10, 10. Do you know that? John 10 comes after John chapter 9, where Jesus heals a man. And the Pharisees say, whoa, 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 what did you do that for? He loved others. And he told that man not to sin anymore. And he told the Pharisees this, Truly, truly, I tell you in John 10 verse 1, Amen if you want to go with that one instead because you already know it and believe it. Do you have ears to hear? Then listen, because you might just be a Pharisee. Just like, ooh, I didn't say that out loud, did I? Just like sometimes in that story of the two brothers, we're that older brother at home, aren't we? Hmm. Do you have ears to hear? Whoever does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in some other way as a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the gate or the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen for his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now let's stop right there just a second. Who is... The one that climbs in another way, the thief or the robber. Satan? Is that what you think? That's what a lot of commentaries will tell you. And they're wrong. Not just I think so. Because he's saying this in a response to the Pharisees who don't want this man to be saved. They're the thieves and the robbers who have not shepherded Israel the way that they should have. They're the church that in this day doesn't live like Jesus Christ, who wears His name but is not His hands and feet. They go to church, but they're not the church. 
Read it. Go back and read John chapter 9, and you can come to me next week and say you agree with me or don't agree with me. But Jesus is telling them this because of their spiritual blindness. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus, yes, because he's going to go on to say, I am the great shepherd, but he's also talking about you and I because we entered the gate because he says, I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you follow in after me, you can lead and shepherd others. The word pastor means to shepherd. And I shepherd you as Jesus shepherds me. If I don't, then I am a false prophet. I am a thief. I am a liar. I'm teaching you an anti-Christ viewpoint. I should be leading you in as Christ leads me. And the sheep listen for his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all that are his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Verse 5, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will flee from him because they don't recognize his voice. Jesus spoke to them using this illustration, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So again he said to them, Truly, truly, I tell you, amen, if you understand this. Do you have ears to, to hear? I am the gate for the sheep. He is the gate. We all enter in through him. But we have a responsibility and we are commissioned to lead others into the fold to be Jesus' hands and feet until He returns. We have a privilege and an honor to do the things that Jesus did as Christians, but even more importantly, as His church. Verse 8, All who came before me were thieves and robbers. Do you see the pattern to the Pharisees and to the other religious leaders that were leading them down the broad path to destruction? But the sheep did not listen to them. True sheep didn't. There was a remnant. I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. You will have eternal life. What are you saved from? The only reason Jesus died was to save you from eternal death? Or did he save you, which we're getting up to verse 10 here in just a minute. Did he save you that you would have abundant life here and now? Did he save you from the pain of this disease and the loss of this loved one and all of the other things in your life that cause you pain. Because they don't really hurt so bad when you know that your eternity is grounded in Him. To be honest with you, we should suffer a lot more because we disobeyed God. We should be all wearing masks when we go outside that have oxygen to breathe because we can't even breathe because He took the atmosphere away from us. But He's a loving God. And he loves the righteous and the unrighteous so that they will see him, acknowledge him, worship him, and live for him. Especially Christians who have been given new life. I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture in this life. Verse 10 the thief comes only to kill, to steal, kill, and destroy. There's what we missed in the verse earlier. Are you a thief? We're not talking about the devil here. The devil is the ultimate thief. He is your master. But you have a responsibility to be the light to this world. Why in the world would you hide it? You have a responsibility to be salt to the earth, as we talked about in Awanas the other day. Do you know that salt, we addressed it, Bob, is one of the most chemically stable compounds there are? You know how you dissolve salt? You dilute it. You water it down. You're not in love like you were originally with Jesus when you would do anything for him because of what he did for you. What good is salt when it loses its saltiness? Not good for anything except to be thrown out. Salt is a preservative. It's, a, it's flavoring. It brings life. Are you the salt of the earth? Or are you a thief that instead, by not realizing it because you're not living for Jesus, has come to steal, kill, and destroy? 
I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Verse 11, Jesus goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. He is to shepherd you so that you can shepherd others. Some of us are called to that position, but we're all called to be his hands and feet. The good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. Will you do the same? The hired hand is not the shepherd, and the sheep are not his own. When he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf pounces on them and scatters the flock. The man runs away because he is a hired servant and is unconcerned for the sheep, which is what the Pharisees were. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them in as well, and they will listen to my voice. And it's our job to bring them in to the fold. The Jews, as a nation, uh, the children of God, rejected their Messiah. Only a remnant were true sheep. The church in this day and age, in my opinion, I'll put that one in there, is doing the same thing. There's only a remnant that are truly living as Jesus' hands and feet especially in this country. That's why the prosperity looks so, gospel looks so good and other things. It watered down salt that is not salty, not good for anything, but to be thrown out because we don't live by every word that comes out of here. More than we live for food, than we live for things. I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them in as well, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. Then we'll have the renewal of all things, won't we? No matter how bad it gets up to that point, no matter all these things we see in Revelation that we're trying to figure out, God is moving us back to a right relationship with Him. If we're going to live in heaven without jealousy and envy and and worship of other things. Why are we not living that way now? Why are we not living life to the fullest, bringing people into the fold, rather than robbing them, stealing from them, directing them down the broad path of destruction, which Jesus was clear that that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were blind leading the blind. Remember from Revelation where we just read, buy salve for your eyes so that you can see. Don't have a lukewarm relationship with Jesus. Have a vibrant, radiant love, a love that is everything and loves others. The reason the Father loves me is that I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. And He gave us authority to go be his hands and feet. This charge I have received from my Father. Are you following Jesus' call in your life? Are you leading the flock? Or do you need to buy some salve? Or will you continue in blindness? Will you continue to have ears and not hear? We're the same thing that Jesus came into in the day of Israel when he came. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hand. And if you believe in Jesus' finished work on the cross, then you are a kingdom child. Are you living like that? Are you loving God and loving your neighbor? Do you have ears that hear and will obey Jesus? Will you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Will you teach these things to your children? Write them upon the doorposts of your house. Or will you pick and choose and be watered down? and teach that kind of religion to those who look at you, who follow after you? Will you truly live for Jesus? I don't know about you. Logan knows what I'm going to do next. But I've decided that I'm going to follow Jesus. <laughs> no turning back.